morning, church. We are so excited to be with you again this morning. Why don't we just stand and come to our feet as we get ready to worship. Before we do that, let's just open up in a quick word of prayer together. Lord God, we are so excited to meet with you this morning. We are so honored to be able to be in your presence this morning. God, we long to be with you. God, right, right now I pray for a new and fresh encounter with you this morning, whether it's our first time, our second time, whatever it be, Jesus, that you would encounter us in a new way, encounter each and every heart on the other side of this screen. Whether we just clicked on it for the first time ever, or we're just stumbling upon it, God, that you would encounter us right here, right now, this morning. So God, we love you, and we give you all the glory this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church, I encourage you, let's go hard this morning. Let's go all in and give him everything that you have. Church, just in your blood. It's making all things right. 
Sing it out. See, be lifted up. to 
sing, be lifted up. Just sing that out. Let your praise, lift it up. 
poesia. You sent the darkness front out of an empty grave. Seated alone in glory, found all the highest praise. You sent the darkness run out of an empty grave. every living thing, Jesus. All things. We glorify you. Who is like you, Jesus? There is no one like you. No one above you. Nobody greater than you, Jesus. God, we thank you for who you are for your love, for your power, Jesus. You reign over all the earth. That's why we don't have to worry about anything, about when things are going to end, when things are going to go back to normal. We don't have to worry because we know who reigns over this earth, over this world. So God, we recognize that's who you are this world. We honor you. God, thank you for meeting us where we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church family. We are so excited that you joined us today. Why don't you go ahead and in the comment section below say good morning, say hello to someone that's tuning in with you. And while you're at it, why don't you just click the share button, tag a friend, and let's spread the gospel to as many people as possible. I love this part where we just get to talk to one another. So go ahead, say good morning, say hello to someone. Uh, before we get into giving, I just want to share a couple things that's going on here at Heart of Worship. If you haven't already heard, every Tuesday we have a drive through food pantry. It has been awesome. The town has been coming uh, to our doorstep and there's so much need uh, that we're able to fulfill as a church body. So we're super excited. If that's something that you want to partner up with, it's something that you want to get involved in, then I encourage you to click the link above uh, to just get connected with what's happening here at Heart of Worship Church. And as many of you may have heard the recent announcement by President Trump that's starting to open up churches and opening up businesses, we want to keep you informed that we are praying about the proper timing and when we will open up our doors and which uh, protocol we'll take when we do that. But we want you to know that right now we're going to continue to meet in this fashion until we can make sure 
everyone is safe entering our church building. With that being said, let's get set to give this morning. There are four ways that you can give this morning. The first way is to go to our website, heartofworshipny.org. Click the giving tab. You can follow the instructions there. The second way to give is you can text any amount to the number 84321. You can follow the instructions that way. You can also download the app Church Center. Search for Heart of Worship Church. Zip code is 11757. And you can follow the prompts that way to give. And the fourth way to give is to mail your gift to 301 West Hoffman Avenue. That's in Lindenhurst, New York. Let's go ahead and get set to pray. Lord God, you are good. We thank you that you are a provider. Lord, we give to you because you gave to us. We give to you, Lord, because we have an opportunity just to sow into your kingdom, God, and just to uh, acknowledge you, God, as our provider and as our giver. That's who you are. God, so this isn't just something that we do, uh, Lord, to just transition, but Lord, this is something that uh, we believe that you are our giver. Lord, we acknowledge you in that way this morning. God, I pray that you bless our offering, bless everyone who gives, Lord, and you can continue uh, to give us all that we need, God. You are our provider, so we love you for that, God, and we bless you this morning for all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, I hope you're ready for the Word of God this morning. So why don't you go ahead, take out your notebooks, take out your phones, your notepads, your highlighters, pencils, whatever it be, and let's get set to dive in. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a blessing to come back into your homes this morning and share a word of God with you. And especially on this very special Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, we're continuing in our series called Woke, where the Spirit of God had woken and awakened up the church, the Church of Christ, and got them started. It's a representation of the beginning of the church. So let's begin. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2 this morning. So let's turn in our Bibles this morning. Before we go there, let me just say a prayer as you're turning. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask your blessings be upon this word today on this very special day when we receive the presence of God in the form of your Holy Spirit, touching and anointing us, uh, your church, to move on to do your will in a very powerful fashion, Father God, for we know that your word says we should not do anything until we have received this power and this promise from on high. So, Father, I pray right now that you would bless this word, the reading of this word, and you would reach into every person's home right now and every heart right now, Father, and that you would touch them in a very special way, Father. We thank you, Lord God, that we are not quarantined, that, Father God, your spirit is never meant to be quarantined. Your spirit is meant to go out and reach to go out to the highways and the byways through your vehicles, through us, your people, your children. So, Father, would you touch us in a very special way, anoint this word in the hearing of it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Can I get somebody to say amen? Amen to everybody in the houses. So we're, in God, we're going to be in the book of Acts right now. Many people when you look at the book of Acts, they call it the Acts of the Apostles, when really in the, 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 a more appropriate or more truthful uh, term for that is really the, the Acts of the Holy Spirit upon the Apostles. So we're still in the book of Acts, you know, as we live in, in this day and age right now, it's the only book that has not ended in Amen. The Spirit of God is still moving, and we're going to see some really powerful things happening, especially during our time right now of COVID-19. We're going through this pandemic, you know, which we're going through. That's what I call it. I call it a pandemic. It has been causing some people some pain, but um, with the, the time that we're in, we need the Holy Ghost even more so. So some of the questions I'm going to ask today is, what does Pentecost mean to you today? And uh, what is Pentecost today? In, in what does it mean prophetically for us today? And as a per personally, uh, what does it mean to us? And what does it mean to us as a church? And what does, it, what does it mean to us as we go forward? And where would it lead us to? So in Acts chapter 2, let's turn our Bibles right now. We're going to read the first 21 verses in that. Acts verse 2. For it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a, a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat on each one of them, and they were filled, filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, some crowds response to this, this whole amazing thing. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and, went confu and were confused because everyone heard them speaking in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parsians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Persia, Pamphia, Egypt, and all parts of Libya joining Cyrene, visiting visitors from Rome, Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Christians and Arabs. 
we hear them speaking in our own tongues with wonderful, doing the wonderful works of God. Verse 12, so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, saying to one another whatever could this mean? Verse 13, number 13, the slims will always be like an unlucky number 13, here's where the crowd started mocking. Others mocking, saying they are full of new wine. But Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he quotes it. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven and above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass, verse 21, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Somebody say amen. Powerful word of God there coming in, God, in, a, in the book of Acts. As many of you know, the, the birth of the church came on the day of Pentecost here. It's, it's known as the birth of the church when the power of God, the spirit of God came as a rushing mighty wind into a crowd of believers in Christ. And he came, the power of God came so great, it was like a, a, it was like a hurricane came. All to those who were believers in Christ, those who were in one mind, they were in one accord, they were unified. And in their, uni, in, in their unity, they're doing the will of God by worshiping and praising God. And while they're doing that, Spirit of God comes and touches them in a very special way. This day, this Pentecost, this day of Pentecost is the birth of the church. It's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You know, in the Old Testament, Pentecost in the Old Testament was when the giving of the law, when God had the people moving through, living in tents, moving through the, the Sinai wilderness before he gave them the law. So it was a celebration, celebration of that. But it used to be in the Old Testament, it was, Pentecost was known as the giving of the law. But now, as we know, Pentecost in the New Testament is the giving of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And all these things were, prophet, were prophetic. These things were prophesied before they would even come. Because come. Jesus, Jesus even told his apostles, do not do anything until you receive the promise from the Father. Jesus even prophesied, prophesied about this, and he said to even to Peter and to all who were listening, when, when Jesus asked all the disciples there, who the men say that I am, and then who do you say that I am? And Peter was the one that responded and said, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. And then Jesus said to Peter, prophetically what is going to happen in the day of Pentecost, he said to him, so Peter, blessed are you, Saphos. Saphos, you are my rock, blessed are you, because man has not given this unto you, but my power which is in, which is in heaven, but the Spirit of God which is in heaven made this revealed to you and upon this word i will build my church so it already came prophetically and even acts chapter 1 verse 8 says this but you shall receive power when the holy spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in jerusalem in all of judea and samaria and to the ends of the work of the earth in pentecost the church was awakened in pentecost the church was woke I know it seems like a silly word, a silly slang word, which you won't probably don't think you'd find the, the, this type of definition in Webster's Dictionary. But woke, woke are people are saying now, using that word, are you woke? I'm woke. So where are you? Where are you? Where does, this, where, does this, uh, where does Pentecost begin with us today? Where are we today with Pentecost? Where are we today prophetically in this particular moment? And where are we today in Pentecost personally as a church, and where is it going to lead us to? So before I can even answer those questions, and this particular sermon is going to answer those questions, I want to lay a little bit of, of a foundation on Pentecost. For those who don't know too much about Pentecost, maybe you haven't heard about that before, I know that it's a feast, but uh, Pentecost in Greek means 50, or also called the counting of the days. The counting of the days. It's also known in the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy, verses 16, it's also called the feast of weeks. So Pentecost is the counting of the days and the feast of the weeks. So the Israelites were called to just to, to count the days of the week for one week and then the second week do the same thing, count the days in that week, do it for a third week, do it for a fourth week and so on until the seventh week. So seven weeks times seven days is 49 days. And on the 50th day, because Pentecost, Pentecost also means 50, counting of the days. So on the, on the 50th day, they would sell, do a celebration. Now we see now on Pentecost is usually celebrated 50 days right after 
right after Passover begins. Now, God had established, as part of this foundation I want to lay to you, is God had established several feasts, many feasts for the Jewish people to, um, to assemble in Jerusalem and for them to celebrate them. And he established these feasts over two different harvest seasons, over the harvest season of spring and over the harvest season of of fall. So there were four seasons, there were four feasts during the, during the spring season, which were Passover, which immediately was followed. That was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then after that was the Feast of First Fruits. Then immediately after that was Pentecost. So those four seasons, those four feasts were the feast over the spring, over the spring um, harvest. Then there were three feasts in the fall. Very first one being Rosh Hashanah was also called the Feast of the, of the Trumpets, where uh, the Jews celebrate that as their new year. Followed by ten, year, 10 days later. 10 days later was Yom Kippur, was their Day of Atonement. And then five days later came the Feast of Tabernacles here. But there were three main feasts, three main feasts for all of the nation of Israel which was to stop working and they were to go to Jerusalem and celebrate these feasts. Now, what's interesting about these feasts, the feasts, these three feasts of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles were the three major feasts. Of these three feasts, though, there's something very interesting to understand here, and it says it in Colossians chapter 2. Because these feasts, according to Scripture, were just a shadow of what was about to occur. They were just a shadow of something that was about to happen. They were just a shadow of something more powerful that was gonna, going to be Realize. And it says this in Scripture in Colossians 2, verses 16 to 17, it says this. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in any holy day or of a new moon or on a Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. See, these feasts were celebrated as a shadow of something that was about to happen. It's as if I was standing face, I was facing the sun and behind, right behind me was cast my shadow. Now the shadow was not the real me. I am the real me, but the shadow was just a reflection of me. So it is with the feast that the feasts are just a reflection of the real thing. And it's the real thing is Christ, Christ the Messiah. So as we stand here today, we look, the things that we're, we're celebrating and things we're seeing in Pentecost, the things we're seeing during Passover, Tabernacles and all the feasts, they're just a shadow of something great that is about to occur, which is Christ the Messiah. So, so another special thing about these three feasts, where many young people, it says it according to Deuteronomy 16 and Exodus 23, many young men, 20 years of age and older, they were to stop all work. They were to stop all work, leave their, farming, their, their farms, and go to Jerusalem and celebrate these three feasts. These three major feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And one thing I want to share with you is the three things, what these things mean. The theme of these, the theme of Passover is a sacrificial lamb given for salvation. So the theme of Passover is salvation. The theme of Pentecost, although in the Old Testament it was about the law, the theme of Pentecost is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the theme of the Feast of Tabernacles is a theme, the theme behind that is resurrection or homecoming. And if I could share a little bit more of this about tabernacles, we can understand that because we hear a lot about Passover. We hear a lot, some things about, about Pentecost, but what is tabernacles? Tabernacles was a feast where the Jews were to celebrate and remember the days when they were in Sinai living in tents. And they were looking forward, say that, they were looking forward to when God would tabernacle with his people again, when he would ha have a homecoming with his people again. Somebody say hallelujah to that. So it's just a shadow here where the Passover represented salvation, Pentecost represented baptism of the Holy Spirit, and tabernacles, the theme behind that, was homecoming and, re and resurrection. So, th the, so these young men, young men over 20 years of age, were required to go, to look forward to these things. And they were to go and celebrate, stop work, celebrate these, these, three, these three major feasts, and out of these feasts, they were to diligently seek God, diligently pray to God, and look forward to the things that God was about to do personally in their lives and at the nation of Israel. So men were to stop all these things. Why were these young men, why were all these young people required to go there? What would be the reason for that? What would be the reason that young men over 20 years of age would have to go to Jerusalem, stop all work. And the reason is simple, is simply is this, because no one can do it for you. You have to do it yourself. Nobody, it's a personal decision, a personal decision to go and to diligently seek God during these seasons 
and ask what he requires of them and what he wants them to do for him. So it's, it's, no one can do it for you. Nobody can get salvation for you. Nobody can, can, can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost for you. Nobody can be resurrected in your place. It's a personal decision. It's a personal decision what you have to do for yourself. The neat thing about this, great thing about this, is we see this unfolding in our lives right now. We see salvation unfolding in it once we came to Christ. We see salvation unfolding in our lives right now. We see the baptism of the Holy Ghost occurring in our lives right now, and we, we look forward. We look forward to what's yet to come. We look forward to some greater thing which is yet to come. Just like the song, greater things are yet to come, greater things are still to be done in the city. Great things are still to be com coming in our lives. So someone say hallelujah to that, because the neat thing is we're seeing this whole shadow of things unfolding in our own lives here. But there's something now, that's all good news, something to be shouting hallelujah for. We should be looking forward. Write that down. We should be looking forward to the greater things to come because these feasts which we're seeing and things that are happening right now are just a shadow of what was, what's a, is about to come. Something great is about to come. And then because of that, I want to drop something on you. And that's something I want to drop on you is that whenever there is a great move of God, whenever God's about to do something great, that there is always some kind of opposition. I mean, for thousands of years, Satan noticed something. He took note of something. He noticed that the favor of God and the blessings of God tended or somehow were linked to the feast. So he's going to do anything he can to stop that. Now look at COVID-19. When did COVID-19 occur? It occurred just before Passover began, just before a congregation, before an assembly of, of the people celebrating this feast would come together. So Satan knows that God's people are, have a favor and that there is a blessing that will come their way and he's going to do anything he can to disrupt that. And so COVID-19 began just before Passover. So now we're in, as my son Mark John mentioned last week, we're into this whole COVID-19 pandemic for about, for about maybe 10 weeks now. But now it's been 50 days. Today, Pentecost Sunday, it's been 50 days since we celebrated Passover. So the enemy is trying to stop this. So could it be, could it be, could it be that during these feast times that God wants to do something powerful? Could it be that during these feast times that Satan wants to stop the, a great, the next great move of God because we're, in a, a, we're in, in a feast, a season of feasts. Could it be that the enemy is trying to disrupt a great move of God? Could it be he knows something? Could it be that he knows that God still wants to move in a powerful way? He's about to move in a powerful way and he's looking to disrupt that. Could it be he sees something that we don't see? Could it be that we should have our eyes open to see that? Most of Jesus' attacks happened on holy days or during the times of the feast days. In John chapter 5, the Jews sought to kill Jesus. They sought to kill Jesus just after he resurrected, just, just after he healed somebody at the pool of Bethsaida. John chapter 5, 16 says, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. So they sought to kill him on the Sabbath. The enemies tried to stop the move of God on the Sabbath. And John chapter, John chapter 6, during the Feast of the Passover, a storm struck the Sea of Galilee. During the Feast of Unleavened Bread, one day is first of unleavened bread. The Passover is only one day, and right after that is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Luke 22, verses 1 to 3, says that Satan enters the Pharisees, instigates them to, to seek out Jesus again to kill him, and also enters Satan's heart. So Luke 22, verses 1 to 3 says, now the Feast of unleavened bread of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, sur surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So we see that even during the feast of unleavened bread, the enemy, Satan, was trying to disrupt a move of God. During the Feast of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 13 says, The Holy Spirit was poured out, Pente uh, Pentecost began immediately, and the scripture says in verse 13, and others mocked. So immediately there was a mocking. There was a crowd that started to see, uh, see as if, and, and surmise that maybe these people are drunk. How are they doing this? So verse 13 says, Others mocked, saying they are full of new wine. So persecution began immediately after the baptism of the Holy Spirit came. And in Acts chapter 20, it talks about Paul being arrested to, uh, at the piece of, uh, around the time of uh, the Feast of, of Pentecost, being arrested. Feast of Tabernacles in John chapter 7, verse 11 says, when, Jesus, when Jesus, Jesus went to the Feast of Tabernacles, 
secretly, but his brothers, his blood brothers, went there ahead of him, and they were following the brothers. The Pharisees were following the brothers to see what Jesus was. And in John chapter 7, verse 11 says, Then the Jews sought him at the feast, saying, Where is he? So again, with all these type of these, these, these uh, again, these few scriptures that I'm showing you show how Satan's plan all along was to attack Christ and the church during the time of these feast days. So why? Why are these feast days a target? Well, first of all, the young people would come together. All young people, all young men over the age of, age of 20 were called to go into Jerusalem. Satan is always after the next generation. Satan wants to stop the next generation from this move of God to the future moves of God, stopping any future moves of God. We see that King Nebuchadnezzar, when he abducted many Jewish boys, he took the, he took the wisest ones, Daniel being one of them, and he tried to convert them. He tried to deceive them. He tried to convert them into the ways of magicians, into the ways of the Chaldeans. So the enemy is like that when it comes to, he wants to attack the next generation, the generation that, to, to stifle them, to deceive them, to rebel, rebel from God. The second thing were the crowds. Crowds would always flock to Jerusalem during the time of the feast days. So... There is a power that comes with numbers. There's a t- power that comes in unity, and Satan knew that. Satan knows that there's a unity, that there's a power that comes to that, and he's going to try to disrupt that as much as, possible, much as possible to disrupt that assembly. The third thing here is when you have crowds, it's a lot easier to spread a rumor. You could say he has a demon. You could say what he had, what, he's not God. He's, he's saying he's the Messiah. He's not the Messiah. What he's doing is a Beelzebub. It's easier to share a rumor, to get a, get a rumor out there when you have many crowds there. So why are the feast days a target? Because God is about to do something great. COVID-19 just happened around this time. It just happened around this time, just before Passover. So we should have our eyes looking forward on what God is about to do. So what would I say here? Today's message, I began with with some questions. Where are we today in Pentecost? And where are we today prophetically at this particular moment? And where are we personally and even as a church? And where is God going to lead us to? So first thing I would say to you is, first point I want to share with you is stay focused, look forward. For they're just a shadow of things to come. Just a shadow of things to come. All the feasts, they concluded, they concluded around September. There are many people out there and the, the scientists or doctors out there are the, the making their own opinions when this whole COVID-19 pandemic is going to end and they're all talking the possibility of September, sometime maybe around even September. September happens to be the end of the, on, on the Jewish calendar, it happens to be the end of the Jewish feast. And it's tabernacles, the last season, the last feast is tabernacles, the homecoming. So could it possibly be, you know, that this whole pandemic will end in September? I don't know. Third base. But if anything, we should have our eyes focused and looking forward on something great that is about to occur. There's a resurrection. There's a tabernacle. God wants a tabernacle with his people. There's a great move of God that's about to happen. So I would say to you, point number one, stay focused, looking forward on what is yet to come, because these things are just a shadow. What's happening in COVID-19 is just a shadow. Something powerful, a move of God is about to occur. So keep your eyes focused on that and look forward because God's favor and blessings still remain on us when we're obedient and when we serve him. And God's favor and obedience is st- and God's favor and blessing is still linked to, to the Passover season, Pentecost season, all the feasts, all the feast days. So stay linked with that. The second thing I would say to you is keep the fire going. Don't allow the fire to go out. God supplies the fire, but we have to supply the wood. In Acts chapter 2, verses 3 to 4 says this. On the day when Pentecost came, it says, uh, it, verse 3 says this, there appeared to them divided tongues of fire, and one sat on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. See, the giving of the Holy Spirit was a giving of God's power. The giving of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a baptism of fire. Fire it wasn't a baptism that John gave. John baptized, you know, with water and went on to repentance. But this was a fire, a fire of the Holy Ghost. And so it's a fire that came down. But we have to keep the fire going. God provided the fire of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You know, it's the baptism of the Holy Ghost that makes all the difference in a person's life. There are many people out there who have religion, but they don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the fire of God. This is something that we all need to have the baptism of fire 
of God. But, so God provides a fire. He provided the baptism of the, of the Holy Ghost, but we need to do something. We have something that we're required to do, and that's to keep this fire going, definitely to keep it going. Proverbs chapter 26, 20 says this, where there is no wood, there is no fire. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Isn't that kind of profound? I heard Jensen Franklin sh share this and this in, a, in a moment, and I just want to share this with you as well. It says it's the fire of God. Where there is no wood, there is, there is no fire. So if, it's amazing that if you don't put wood on the fire, it's a matter of time before that fire goes out. If you don't put wood on the fire, it's a matter of time before all you have is ashes. There are some people out there that you, you have ashes now that once used to be a fire, all because you didn't add wood on the fire. You know what? Our prayer is the wood for the fire. Our assembling with the brethren is wood for the fire. Our praise and our worship is wood for the fire. Our forgiving one another is wood for the fire. Us letting go of offenses that people haven't been offended with, holding on to an offense. You know, letting go of that offense is wood for the fire. Living a holy life is wood for the fire. Praising God is wood for the fire. God has given us everything. We have to keep the wood on the fire, resisting temptation, even when you're secluded, even when you're alone in your own bedroom, even when you're alone in your own room, wherever you are, secluded and isolated, resisting temptation is wood for the fire. We should be praying, Father, in Jesus' name, let the fire of God touch us right now, refresh us brand new. As a matter of fact, lift your hands up right now so I can say a prayer for you. Father, in Jesus' name, for everybody's hands that lifted up right now, let the fire of God refresh us right now, fresh and new. We come before you in Jesus' name, ask you to cleanse us of our sin, and Father, baptize us fresh and anew right now. Anoint us that we may go forward to do your will like they did in that upper room, Father, praising God in unity, Lord, and you came down with a fire, you came down with a thunder, you came down with the wind, and you filled them all with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Father, right now in Jesus' name, for everyone who's listening, I pray, Father, that you transfer right now and touch them with a fire and a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. Guide them, direct them, Father God. Counsel them in every single way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen? Amen. So stay focused. Keep on looking forward. Keep the fire going. And the final point I want to make to you is make it personal. Make it personal. These are men over the age of 20 was told to stop. They were instructed to stop work, leave their homes, their farming villages, and go and celebrate diligently and seek God. They did it because God knows you, you have to do this personally. It's a personal decision. No one can be saved for you. Again, no one can be baptized in the Holy Ghost for you. And again, lastly, no one can be resurrected in your place to be resurrected to life. So it's a personal decision that you have to make. You have to stand before the Lord and approach the Lord right now and ask him to come into your heart to be your Lord and your Savior. You have to come before the Lord and ask him to, re to receive, person receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then when you have those two, then you're guaranteed a resurrection unto life. So your Passover, your, your Pentecost, and your tabernacles, when we're looking forward to God tabernacling with his, with his people again, for his word says, God said God's house, his tabernacle is with men. And he wants to tabernacle with you. It's a personal decision. So you have to make it personal. You know, the woman with the issue of blood, she made it personal. She stopped all of what she was doing. She spent all of her money on doctors, and she made it personal. She pressed through the crowds. She was considered unclean because she had a, a blood disorder. She was considered unclean, but she still, nonetheless, made it personal. Pressed through the crowds and said, if I just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, I shall be made whole. Make it personal. Acts 2.21 says, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That was the last verse we read when we, op when we opened up on uh, uh, Acts chapter 2. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The woman called upon the name of the Lord. She made it personal. One leper comes to Jesus. He made it personal. He saw Jesus coming and he approached Jesus. The apostles didn't want him to approach him because you're supposed to keep, keep social distance. You're supposed to have social distancing from lepers. So Jesus was approaching him. This man was approaching Jesus and he said to Jesus, if you are willing, you can heal me. He made it personal. Jesus walked up to him and the first thing Jesus did was touch him. Touch him and then say, I am willing and he was healed. So it was that one leper that made it personal. 
the centurion, a Roman soldier, a Roman soldier comes to Paul after the day of Pentecost. He comes to Paul and he, and he seeks out Paul. He say, tell me, tell me about this gospel. Tell me about this Jesus. He was a believer. He wanted to know more about Jesus. The Roman centurion wasn't a Jew. He was a Gentile. A Roman centurion comes and makes it personal. A prostitute comes to Jesus and makes it personal. She, she breaks her alabaster, a very expensive bottle of perfume, which could have been years worth of wages. She breaks it and pours it on Jesus' feet, washes his feet with her hair. She made it personal. Philippian jail, when Paul and Silas are in jail, they're praising God for, for, for you know, they, they were cast into jail, they were cast into prison, they were incarcerated in the prison cell before delivering a, a, a woman of a demon. So they were, in the, they were doing a godly thing and they got incarcerated for that and they started to pray and an earthquake came and opened up all the jail cells and the Philippian jail or the guard that was guarding Paul and Silas made it personal because he recognized this was, the, was a move of God. He falls down on his knees making it personal and saying, Gentlemen, what must I do to be saved? So I'd say it has to be personal. Make it personal. The book of Isaiah, I'm going to close with this scripture. It says, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. Behold, I will do a new thing. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? Shall you not perceive it? God is about to do a new thing. Where are we in Pentecost today and where are we in this particular moment? Mark John preached last week about awakening your perspective. If we were to look forward, continue to look forward, well, this is linked to that message. If you would continue to look forward and perceive, the Lord even says, can you not perceive it? Keeping our eyes looking forward on what God is about to do, looking beyond this pandemic was just a shadow. It's not the real thing. The real thing is about to come. God is about to do something mighty. So like it's a move of God. Where are we today in Pentecost prophetically? Well, God is about to do something new. He's about to do something very powerful. And God wants us to be focused on that. And I pray that you make it a personal decision to be looking on it, to looking at that. Jeremiah 33, 3 says this, call upon me and I will answer you and I will show you mighty things, great things, which you know not of. God calls us. God calls us to keep on our focus upon him. God calls us to perceive what he's about to do. God calls us to look forward. God calls us to just to keep the fire burning, keep the fire going. We so will look forward to getting back with you real soon, you know, in the church here. We know we're thankful for the president for recognizing that churches are, the churches are now essential. And I'm thankful for him doing that. And we are planning, we're, got, we're in the midst of preparing a plan, but we take your health no, very seriously. We take the health of the church very seriously and we take this very responsibly as well. So we're not going to jump into it right away, but we just want to let you know that we are preparing to do that and we're looking forward to when we can gather together again and assemble once again and look forward again for what God is about to do. Keep your eyes focused upon him and make it a personal decision. So right now, all those who have not made a personal decision yet, and for those right now who are, just, uh, who are listening and want to rededicate your lives right now, let's make a personal commitment and dedication unto the Lord right now. Let's ask him for a fresh touch, a fresh new baptism to touch us right now. And let's also ask the Lord to help our eyes to look forward, not to look to the left or the right, but to keep on looking forward. Keep your eyes focused. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you right now and we just rededicate our lives to you. I pray to everyone who's listening right now that they would pray a prayer and pray a prayer. Re repeat these words after me. Father, in Jesus' name, I come before you as a sinner asking you to cleanse me of all of my sins, of all of my mistakes, of all of my misunderstandings. Father, wash me in the blood of your son, Jesus. Father, come into my heart. Be my Lord, be my Savior, Jesus. Guide me and instruct me in all of my ways. Father, I pray for a fresh touch of your baptism of your Holy Spirit. Fill me, Father, with your Spirit right now. As I breathe in the Spirit of the Holy Ghost, 
you were doing that right now, Father. Cover me, guide me, protect me. Place your angels about me, Father, as I do your will. Father, I pray for that fresh baptism right now to touch me in Jesus' name. Father, anoint my eyes. Anoint my eyes to always look forward, to not get caught up on what my trials are going through right now, to not get caught up and focused on all my pain, all my, my troubles, all my suffering. Help me, Lord, anoint my eyes to be looking forward. For everything else is just a shadow of the things to come, but you are the real thing, Father God, Christ. So, Father, help and anoint our eyes to stay focused upon you, to perceive you in all things, and to look forward for greater things to come and greater things to be done. Father, help us in Jesus' name to keep the fire going. Holy Spirit, touch me. Holy Spirit, quicken me. Holy Spirit, help me to discern when you're speaking and when the enemy is speaking. Help me to discern my schedule, to put down things which are not important so that I may keep my eyes on you and keep the fire of prayer, the fire of praise, the fire of worship, the fire of assembling with the brethren, and the fire of love and forgiveness and mercy to be a part of my life from this moment forward. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Well, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for everyone who's heard this message today, and I pray that each and every one of us made a dedication to you. The Father, we thank you for their new life that's in Christ, that their Pentecost, their day of the church, their day, personal day has happened. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that you'd help them to, to their eyes as they prayed to look forward, Lord Jesus. Father, I pray that they keep the wood on the fire, that they would assemble, they'd assemble with the right people. And Father God and Lord, they would hear your word of God, and they would just take notes, Father, and get, get strengthened in that. Father, I thank you for every personal dedication that was made today. Father, we thank you for them. Their names are now written in the Lamb's book of life. And Father, I thank you. And I look forward to the day when I can assemble with them and embrace them right here in church and as, as you embrace them in the kingdom of God. So Father, thank you all for everyone who's heard. Thank you for this message. And Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, pleading the blood of Jesus upon this message and upon everyone who heard this word today. Lord, by the power of your spirit and power of Pentecost, let tongues of fire fall upon them and as they assemble in your name. Comfort them and guide them to this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. They say what you see is what you get. There's more to life than meets the eye. They don't believe what they don't understand. I've touched your hands. I've felt your side.